Welcome guys to the investigation in heart failure. Very, very simple. But first I want to mention something, okay? So patients that are known with heart failure, okay? Remember I'm on heart failure, maybe I'm taking my medication, I'm fine. The medication have pulled me out of decompensation, I'm completely fine, so I'm asymptomatic, okay? But then I get an infection and boom, I'm orthopnic, I'm having PND. So that's what's called decompensated because when you're on the drugs, you're fine. So you are compensated. So your chronic heart failure is compensated because you are taking your medication. You are not doing the wrong things. Okay. Then you get an infection or you got a, maybe anemia or something. Then boom, your symptoms are back. That's what we call you precipitated something or you triggered heart failure. Or what you call decompensated heart failure. Now what are those things that can decompensate heart failure? It's actually a mnemonic. It's called failures. Okay. F is actually for failure to take medication. That's very common in our setting. Patients stop taking their medication, boom, they decompensate, okay? A for arrhythmias, very important, especially atrial fibrillation, especially in the elderly, very common in our setting to decompensate a patient, okay? Number two thing is I. I is for infarct, okay? If the patient had the myocardial infarction infarct, okay? Or the patient has a ischemia, a current ischemic event, or finally, an infection. Very, very common in our setting, especially infection, particularly a UTI and a pneumonia. So screen for those things because those can cause uh, failures, okay? Then that's AI. L is for lifestyle, especially patients that binge drink alcohol or they went for a barbecue and they took in too much salt, okay? This patient decompensate, okay? Okay, then you have D, which is your, uh, you, sorry, which is your up dynamic, up dynamic, increasing your demands, your high output. So patients that are pregnant can decompensate. Patients that are having chronic anemia, especially anemia, very common in our setting, they can develop uh, decompensation, okay? R is for renal failure, of course, um, failures. E is for emboli, okay, or endocarditis. Any, whether you got a PE or you got an infective endocarditis, an acute setting can decompensate heart failure, okay. And final other things, especially drugs like NSAIDs or uh, yeah, a multitude of other things or UNA derangements can precipitate heart failure. So it's very, very important when you are working up your patient, these are the things that you play in mind. Okay, now how do we wake up a patient in an OSCE or you are asked how would you investigate someone who has acute decompensated heart failure? Always group your things, okay? You say number one, doctor, I will do my bedside test, then bloods, which is your serology, then imaging. Group it very well, you always have a flow, okay? Uh, for the bedside, I mean, think about the bedside, you can do an ECG, okay, what will it tell you? It will tell you, is the patient having AFib, remember, it's it decompensated, so arrhythmias, ne? such as AFib, okay, is the patient having an MI, okay, signs of ischemic heart disease, because that can precipitate heart failure, okay, and of course, any other features that will be helpful, chamber enlargement, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy that are in keeping, maybe we can try to find out the likely pathology under it. Okay. What else can you do at the bedside? An echo, as much as in our setting is not always at the bedside, echo is actually a bedside test, okay? Because it's just an ultrasound of the heart, okay? So it's not always useful to do it in the acute setting. Always remember that. In the acute setting, it's not useful, always. Um, the indications for using an ultrasound, uh, an echo, in the acute setting are in the management video. But it does help you, especially for the long run, okay? You want to know is it systolic failure or diastolic failure? Okay. Am I dealing with an ejection fraction that is reduced mid-range or preserved? Okay. Speaking of uh, ejection fraction, remember, normal ejection fraction, anything between 52% uh, and above is normal ejection fraction. And then we categorize heart failure into three. Okay. Either it's preserved, pre preserved ejection fraction is any ejection fraction above 50%. 50% and above is preserved. Then we have mid-range, which is 40 to 49. And then anything lower than 40% is called reduced ejection fraction. Okay, so again, the echo will help you. Are you having a valve problem? Are you, what's the likely pathology that you will pick up? Okay, so the echo is really useful. And finally, the third bedside test that you have to do is a urine dipstick. Why? Because remember, UTI is very common precipitant for heart failure. Then you say, I'll do the bloods, okay? Bloods, what am I looking for? Number one, I'll look at the FBC. Okay? Why am I looking at the FBC? Why it's cell count? Because the patient can be anemic. Anemia is a precipitate, okay? Then why else are you looking at the FBC? Um, 
not so white cell count, so the HP for your anemia, then white cell count for infection, if anything, a pneumonia or a UTI, it will be raised, okay, so that's useful to do. Okay, what else are you going to look at? UNEs, okay, remember, you are going to give ACE inhibitors, you are going to give spinal relactone, all those things can cause hyperkalemia. If the patient is already hyperkalemia, you probably don't want to give those drugs. Number two, remember UNE derangement, renal failure, can precipitate heart failure. Okay. Number three, what you look at, you can do LFTs, not always advised because it doesn't change management. Okay, LFTs, of course, if I'm having right-sided heart failure, my liver is uh, congested, so you have a clinical picture, they will be deranged uh, transaminases because obviously you are congesting the liver, but the clinical significance is very irrelevant. Okay, number four, the, uh, you look at, you screen for thyroid. Remember, hyperthyroidism, maybe that's somewhere we need to fit into failure. Hyperthyroidism is one of the things you always have to roll out because it can precipitate heart failure. And it's under that up dynamic, your pregnancy, your chronic anemia, and hyperthyroidism. Very important because it can precipitate heart failure. So you screen with TSH. You don't do the whole profile. TSH should be enough. Okay, because if it's low, then you're thinking, I'll do the whole panel to look for hyperthyroidism. Okay, what else are you going to do? They say a test called the brain natriuretic peptide. That's what we used to call it in the past. Now we call it B-type natriuretic peptide. Okay, it's actually a hormone that is produced when the heart is stretched, okay, especially the ventricles. There's this hormone called uh, B-type natriuretic peptide that is released by the, um, the heart. Okay, so... It's helpful, B-type natriuretic peptide, it's helpful to do it in the clinical setting because in the acute setting, we do it in the acute setting because sometimes it's very hard to differentiate uh, um, acute dyspneas because a patient just comes in with dyspnea. You will not say I have heart failure or I have lung pathology. It's very hard to differentiate, for example, a acute decompensated heart failure from, say, an exacerbation of COPD. Very, very hard because they almost present the same way. So how do you differentiate that? Is this the heart that is causing the dyspnea or is this something else? Okay. So if B-type nitrogenated peptide is raised, then you are sure it's the heart because it's the only the heart that produces that hormone. Okay, so it's very useful in the acute setting if you are not sure is this dyspnea coming from the heart, is this dyspnea coming from somewhere. So it's only used when you're in doubt. Okay, what else are you going to order? Of course, uh, eventually you need to do a lipogram just to see the cardiovascular risk factor that the patient may need statins. Okay, you can do other things if the patient comes in with chest pain, you think it's an MI, do some cardiac markers, and other tests will be depending on the clinical picture. Okay, when we move on to imaging. Okay. Imaging is only one thing that is important, really, and that is your chest X-ray. What do you want to do with the chest X-ray? Remember, pneumonia infection is one of the precipitants, so you want to rule it out. Okay, so you want to rule out the X-ray. Nervous consolidation that you are going to pick up. Of course, there may be signs of heart pathology, especially if you have a cardiomyopathy. Then you see cardiomegaly. Okay, are you seeing any obvious features? For example, mitral stenosis has certain features on your chest X-ray that will help you again with your clinical picture. Okay, are you seeing Kelly B lines? Are you seeing a pleural effusion or signs of pulmonary edema? Again, those things just support your diagnosis. But at least the chest X-ray must rule out your pneumonia. That is how you investigate a patient with heart failure. And the final thing that uh, I want to talk about is how do you diagnose left heart failure? This is important because it just come in MCQs, and that is by the modified Framingham, as I'm showing it there. Okay? The major criteria and the minor criteria. Okay? The major criteria is your PND, S3, Gallop. Remember, a Gallop, especially S3, is very specific for heart failure. The moment the patient has an S3 Gallop, you know it's one of the most specific uh, signs that the patient is in overt heart failure especially left heart, okay? The patient has rails, okay? Radiologic cardiomegaly, okay? Radiologic pulmonary edema. And then your minor is your dyspnea on ordinary exertion, nocturnal cough, tachycardia of greater than 120, radiologic pleural effusion, weight loss of greater than 4.5 in five days in respiratory, uh, in resp to diuretic treatment or whatever, okay? So I hope that concludes how do you investigate a patient with heart failure. Bedside, Bloods, imaging. End of story. Cheers.